Hello, I hope you find yourself well. So today we're going to start a new topic, actually. So we have finished things related to time independent perturbation theory. And we will start today time dependent perturbation theory. So I mean, there's something to comment about these names, right? Uh, why time dependent, time independent. So just to clarify, what's the big picture? We have an equation, which is a Schrodinger equation. And what we are doing is basically solving new problems based on old problems by means of introducing perturbations. So basically there is a perturbation to the problem like a perturbation Hamiltonian. And then we propose an expansion uh, in terms of a parameter. So this is a perturbative expansion. Now, we always have Schrodinger equation. It's just that in time independent perturbation theory, I guess it's called because you have this notation for time independent Schrodinger equation when you solve the eigenvalue problem of Schrodinger equation. So basically you have passed from Schrodinger equation to its eigenvalue problem, and then you apply perturbation theory to the, uh, solving the eigenvalue problem of Schrodinger. And that is time independent perturbation theory as we saw. On the other hand, time dependent perturbation theory focuses on finding a solution by means of a perturbative expansion to actually the full Schrodinger equation. So we haven't passed from equation to its eigenvalue problem. And I guess in this usual notation in physics where they talk about time dependent Schrodinger equation for the actual Schrodinger equation and time independent for the eigenvalue problem where this distinction in the discipline of physics between time dependent and time independent perturbation theory comes. But I mean, basically on one in time independent perturbation theory, what you're doing is solving by means of perturbation expansions, the eigenvalue problem. In time dependent perturbation theory, you're actually solving the Schrodinger equation by means of a perturbative expansion. And so the math is basically based on these perturbative methods uh, where you propose uh, basically a, a perturbative expansion as a solution. And then these types of methods of adding the perturbative parameter, proposing solutions in terms of these expansions, and then carrying out for the coefficients defining the uh, full solution, which are the so-called corrections, can be applied to either the full PD as in Schrodinger, which will be what we will do today in time dependent perturbation theory, or to its second value problem as we saw in the last lectures. So having this clarification in terms of the notation, the names, and what we are actually doing in terms of the physics and the math, I'm gonna start uh, sharing the screen. Um, yeah. So again, I'm gonna start today time dependent perturbation theory, which focuses on the solution by means of perturbation methods of the actual Schrodinger equation, not only of its eigenvalue problem, but the full PDE, which of course has some time dependency. In the eigenvalue problem, you have removed it by proposing these eigen solutions, but not in this case. And the first part that I'm gonna present is how to calculate the probability that the system transitions from one quantum state to a different one. Uh, so that will be the focus of today's lecture. Um, and well, let's start. So this is interesting because when we have uh, induced transitions across systems, uh, usually what you have is a time dependent uh, Hamiltonian, like a time dependent electric field and its associated uh, potential. Uh, so that of course is important for the purpose of applications. And also because if you think about it before you uh, have studied problems which, in which the potential has no time dependence, it's time independent. And the prediction so far that you have seen is that basically you have stationary states, which are the eigenstates. And even if you have higher levels of energy, say for example, uh, in principle, according to that theory, 
where you have seen only time independent potentials. So they don't, they are not, the potentials are not a function of time. Even if you have an excited uh, state, it wouldn't seem to transition. We will see later on that that's not completely the case. Um, but we need to do the presentation of time dependent potentials for that. And in order to solve them, we need this framework of perturbation theory for Schrodinger equation in the full problem, which is the so-called time dependent perturbation theory. So this is the whole reason we are here today. And uh, yeah, both applications, of course, emission and absorption of radiation by an atom, for example, but we'll see. First, we'll just consider things abstractly, and then we will define little by little the specificities of our system, uh, what we're dealing with, initial conditions, etc. So, okay, we have Schrodinger equation, and before uh, we had already solved, let's say, a problem with a given Hamiltonian, which had no uh, time dependency in its potential, for example. And uh, we know the solutions, right? So for the old Hamiltonian operator, which is denoted H naught, we know the eigen solutions, basically eigen states, and then the energies, which are the eigenvalues. So this problem is considered solved. So we assume that we uh, know this for the old problem. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're introducing this notation, uh, which is more um, aligned with what Mike Gerby does. And what we're going to do is to perturb the Hamiltonian by adding uh, this term. So this um, new term in the Hamiltonian is going to be H prime and is going to be controlled by a parameter epsilon. I must say that uh, in the different references that I have consulted, uh, they don't use the epsilon. They go straight to basically make the epsilon parameter equal to one and proceed. I prefer to keep it for, um, well, in order to be proper mathematically, and then that will help us recognize uh, the hierarchies across different terms. So I will eliminate it, of course, at the end as usual, but I want to keep it as much as possible so that you see how actual perturbation theory works mathematically. So in any case, this is our Hamiltonian, our old term plus a new term with a control parameter epsilon. Uh, and well, for this new Hamiltonian, which now has a time dependence because of H prime, we want to find the new eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, so the energies, right? So what we want to find is basically um, the time evolution of the general Schrodinger equation uh, for the whole problem. So yeah, actually, I won't solve the eigen part for this one, but uh, uh, basically the full solution based on the old solution. So we have the Schrodinger equation for the full problem. And then we have the new Hamiltonian, which is the sum of these two contributions. And what we know from the old problem is that, uh, well, any wave function can be represented in the basis of the eigenstates, right? So that's uh, basically an orthonormality property and a complete basis in the Hilbert space that we're dealing with. And so this is the state. This is a sum over the possible states associated to a given, say, energy. Then I have the, so this is, or this was obtained in the old problem by means of an eigen solution. So this is the eigen state. This is the time dependence that was removed in the eigen problem, but it pops up. Uh, once you deal with the whole problem. And these are coefficients, right? So this is the way we can represent any state at a given time. Now, the thing is that we are solving the full problem in time dependent perturbation theory, not only the eigenvalue one. And that means that this wave function state is gonna have some time dependence. And formally speaking, uh, basically these coefficients won't be the same because you're having a potential that is affecting in time the solution, right? So this coefficient Cn doesn't need to stay the same. Therefore, Cn is also going to change in time because the solution is changing in time due to the effect of the uh, perturbing potential, which is time dependent. And well, I mean, this is still valid because at 
every given time, the wave function is represented by the basis. That's a mathematical property related to Hilbert spaces and the completeness of uh, the eigenbasis obtained by means of the old problem. So what I'm trying to say is that the solution to the new problem at any time can actually be represented in terms of this basis if we allow these coefficients to be time dependent, because at every time the representation will be proper. We just need to change or let these coefficients, uh, let these coefficients to change in time and we're good. So what we're doing is basically representing the solution of this problem in terms of these bases of the old Hamiltonian and passing the time dependence to the coefficients. And so this is a series solution of the new problem based on the old problem in the sense that uh, they are the terms accompanying your coefficients in the series expansion. So everything is legal at this point. And basically, if we find these coefficients, we find the solution for the whole time dependent problem and we're done. So we're just finding the solution by means of finding uh, the coefficients in the series. So, well, this is basically a series representation of the solution in terms of the old eigenbasis. If I plug in, in my Schrodinger equation, these bases, okay, I start here, right? So this is my Schrodinger equation. If I take time derivative to this term, well, basically, okay, I have to take partial derivative with respect to time of these two time dependent terms. Notice that the, I mean, the exponential depends in time, even if it's oscillatory, but I mean, you still have to count it. And then you have the Hamiltonian, which is made of these two terms. And well, you use linearity. Uh, you basically will apply this operator to the whole uh, series. And well, by linearity, you can introduce this inside the series. If we continue the calculation on this side regarding the time derivative, well, I mean, we basically have the derivative of a product. So, okay, uh, we have a new term because now the CNs depend on time. So this was not happening when the CNs were constant. And this is our old friend um, when we basically introduce the eigen solutions in the full Schrodinger equation. Um, so, uh, well, on this side, we continue this, um, this uh, two contributions of these two terms. Uh, again, we use linearity. So that's why H naught is being applied to the state N on this side. Then we have epsilon H prime. Epsilon later on will be our perturbation parameter. For the moment, we simply define it as accompanying the perturbation H prime and being uh, some sort of control parameter. Uh, so it's, I mean, that way of thinking is similar to what we saw before because that's the framework of perturbation method. So, well, what we know is that uh, these are the uh, basically solutions of the old uh, Schrodinger equation and the old um, basically eigen solutions, right? So, I mean, this term carries the time dependence in the eigen state. So they have this oscillation. And this um, bracket n or ket n was found by solving the eigenvalue problem. So uh, bracket n doesn't have time dependence. But because they solve the uh, basically Schrodinger equation for the old Hamiltonian, of course, they will satisfy this equation, right? This is Schrodinger equation where you have the old Hamiltonian H naught. And of course, if you apply it on this side, well, this goes out, then you have H naught of n. And then you'll have the time derivative of uh, the exponential, which carries out this term. The reason I'm doing that is because, I mean, this term is actually popping up clearly when we consider these two. Um, this term is showing up in this part clearly because you have the factor minus i e n over h bar. And this other one is showing up when you consider basically h naught n. Because what we're doing is expanding the new solution in terms of a series of the old solution and allowing time dependence on the coefficients. 
So when you take derivative of a product, I mean, the first part, when you basically consider just the time derivative of this part is gonna be as if you're taking only uh, the solution to the Schrodinger equation in the old problem. And uh, well, in this other part, it's just related to considering the effect of this term. So basically what is popping up in this term in uh, the left and right hand side in parts of the terms are basically the solutions of the old problem. And I mean, this is related to the solution to Schrodinger equation in the old problem. If I simply multiply by the coefficient CN and add the sum, I literally have these two terms. Well, this one in the sum, of course, and then this one. So they are gonna be eliminated because I already know them equal since those are related to solutions of Schrodinger equation for the old problem, which makes sense as I'm solving this one, right? So the difference is that now I have coefficients that are time dependent, therefore uh, their derivatives are gonna appear when I take this operator. And on the other, well, the contribution of H prime is gonna show up. So basically, I can eliminate terms of this sum and I can restrict the sum just for this term on this side and just on this other term on this other time side, since this and these contributions are equal from the old problem. And so they vanish in the new equation. So that's why I get this equation, eliminating the uh, terms that are equal because of uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation in the old problem, which makes sense as in that case, the coefficients uh, CNs were, uh, CN were no, time, or no time dependent. And um, well, I have to focus now on this solution, right? So, well, if you remember when we wanted to obtain a coefficient in our previous, um, the study of perturbation theory basically projected along the state of interest and then continued computing, right? So that's exactly what we're gonna do. I want to obtain the coefficient CK in this expansion. So I take inner product with respect to the K state, which is gonna be on the left-hand side on both sides of the equation. Notice that I have an epsilon term, which of course is coming from this part, well, over here but that's gonna be important for the perturbation later. So if I continue, uh, basically I do the projection by linearity, many terms are gonna come out. That's why I have the K uh, dot N over here. Um, on this side, I also will take out some constants and use linearity, et cetera. And I have basically uh, the matrix element of H prime uh, Kn. So, well, uh, the basis was known to be orthonormal. So that's uh, going to be useful in order to basically just keep the uh, term related to n equal to k, which is why the sum gets reduced to this. And on this side, I have again the matrix element, and I can simply pass the exponential to the other side uh, to have this expression. So this is except for a factor of IH bar, which uh, for presentation purposes, I, clip on, I keep on this side. I have the time derivative of the k coefficient obtained by projection and is obtained by uh, this uh, series solution in terms of these coefficients. So now I have a sum over the states n uh, of Cn times the exponential of this difference and then times the matrix element uh, Kn, right? And of course, I mean, I could integrate if I basically uh, use calculus and I apply an integral from zero to t. Uh, so this is uh, ckt minus ck zero, and this is epsilon over ih bar, and the sum over n of the integral from zero to time of these terms. So, okay, so far so good, right? I mean, the math is clean. Everything's nice, but I want to stress something. I mean, at this point, I haven't used anything of perturbation theory. 
What I have done only so far is to simply propose a series solution for a time dependent problem. Okay. And basically related to this part. So I express my solution as a series solution in terms of the old uh, eigenbasis and allowing these coefficients to be time dependent. If I solve for these coefficients, I have the solution of this problem. So that is quite typical actually in ODEs or PDEs in a way, because I'm pretty sure you have seen a treatment of the problem in this way. So this is not new, but um, so far everything is exact. The epsilon is just appearing because I have this control parameter in the Hamiltonian. And now it is when I will start to use uh, perturbation theory, um, not before. So at this point, things are exact, just clarify. Now, where do we start using perturbation theory? Well, because I want an expression, I mean, this is some sort of integral equation, right? And basically if I want to get the solution of this, I mean, there is no way to obtain it unless I know the CNs, but it's kind of like a convoluted problem in a way. But well, this is where perturbation uh, theory comes to help us because I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say, okay, I want the solution for the coefficients as a function of time. I'm gonna consider them as uh, basically a perturbative expansion where I get uh, further and further corrections of higher order, right? And so I have the zero term, the order one term, which is a power of epsilon, the um, order two, which is order epsilon squared, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what I'm gonna do is, and this is where perturbation theory starts, to introduce this series expansion in this time dependent equation. And then let's see where I get. Now, it's noticeable that on this side, I have a parameter epsilon. So this is interesting because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in this series on this side and on this side, which is exactly what I did on this part. So for CK, the series is introduced. For uh, CN over here as well. And then you have an epsilon term, which is basically gonna increase the order on the right-hand side of the equation. So now we start to understand how perturbation theory is involved in the solution. So these terms are gonna be of basically an order higher in a way. And so here I start the series with basically j equal to zero for epsilon j. Whereas here actually I start with epsilon one. So basically j equals zero, epsilon j plus one, et cetera, et cetera. So it's simpler if I simply take the zero order term on this side and then I take the sum. And here I re-express the sum starting from j equal to one. Of course I have, I mean, if I start, if I change the index, I have to change it over here too. That's why I have a j minus one over here, et cetera, et cetera. And again, the solutions that are perturbative have this technique, right? Propose a series expansion in terms of the perturbative parameter of different orders, then match the expansions. And uh, yeah, I mean, by matching equal powers, we see the nature of the problem. So at order zero, there is no term on the right-hand side. And so the time derivative of the zeroth order term is zero. So that's important. On the other hand, for, uh, for higher orders, basically order one and above, the time derivative of the term at order j is related to the terms of order j minus one. So this is also important. This is very interesting, right? So basically, I mean, uh, if we focus a little bit more on the interpretation, since the derivative of this term is uh, zero, then this term is constant. That we know. Um, on the other hand, uh, well, let's stick to the first order uh, term because that's gonna be uh, until where we're gonna go um, in this study. So if I plug in basically j equal to one, I have that the time derivative of the terms of order one is related 
to the terms of order zero, which I know are gonna be constant from the equation at the previous order, right? So basically, once I know this, then I have the DFQ, yeah, the differential equation for the CK, and I can solve this problem. In general, I mean, again, this is, um, well, uh, yeah, I could make uh, some comments, but I'm gonna hold them a second. But in any case, um, so far the approach has been mathematical. It's basically propose a solution to the new problem based on the old problem, allowing time dependency of the coefficients, we're done. So I have to give some physics information uh, to the problem so that once I fit it with that, I start to get things more concrete. Because, I mean, I need to know which problem I'm modeling, right? I mean, I have to get the these coefficients because they are the zero order version of, of the solution coefficients. Uh, I have to know their values. And so that is gonna come from the initial conditions. In fact, I mean, first of all, that's the most reasonable choice for an initial guess. Second, what, I'm, what is gonna happen is that basically, I'm gonna define these coefficients which are constant by the initial conditions and in this perturbative solution, the zero order condition, the zero order coefficients are gonna take care of the initial conditions. And then all the others will take care of basically the corrections. But at this point, this is what I'm gonna do. And there's also something else uh, that is important to mention, which is in terms of the problem we're trying or we are uh, thinking about, in time independent perturbation theory, excuse me, what you think about is that, okay, you have the unperturbed problem and then at the initial time, you turn on like with a switch, the perturbation. And so that starts affecting the time dependency of the solution via its coefficient. So the initial condition is gonna be the initial state of the system before it was perturbed. At, at the initial time, I start perturbing, right? So most importantly, because say the state was unperturbed before or until the initial condition, let's assume that it's in a defined state, which I'm gonna call I like this, which stands for initial. So this is the initial state. Then I turn on the time equal to zero, the switch for the perturbation. I know that that's gonna affect basically um, the probability that I'm in another state later on, different to I. And that's what I want to inquire about. What is the probability of being in another state F? F um, stands for final in a way, uh, but of course there is a span of possibilities. And I want to know what is the probability of being in a state F at a later time T. So again, the way I'm gonna define the zero order coefficients, which are known to be constant by my zero order equation is by means of the initial conditions. So they're gonna satisfy the initial conditions. And because, and this is again, where the physics starts, I assume from the particular setting of the problem that I'm solving that the initial state is just an eigenstate I then that means that only basically the coefficient C zero I, so zero stands for the order, I starts for the coefficient associated to that state. This one is gonna be one because that was the state of the solution. Uh, if you go back basically to this part, only the term with N equal to I will survive at the initial condition. And all the others are gonna be zero because the state was very well defined at the beginning before, right before I started the perturbation. So if I express this in terms of Kronecker deltas, the coefficients at the zeroth order, which are constant and which are defined equal to the initial condition of the problem are basically Kronecker deltas, where only the uh, C zero I is equal to one or is non-zero. All the others are zero because I started at the state I which is an eigenstate of the problem. So the other point that I wanted to mention, which I will use um, my time to talk about it right now, 
is that if you go back to this equation before I focused only on the first order, basically the terms at the order j are defined by the terms at the order j minus one. So you can also think of this approach of uh, perturbation theory as an iterative method where I solve first for the coefficients at the given order. And then I go to the next order and I have to solve this differential equation based on my solutions at the previous order. It is in this way that the, the method is somehow iterative and it has to do with this extra epsilon term that we have, right? I mean, over here. So this is basically distinguishing the new order in the time derivative for the coefficients versus the old order or j minus one, which is the right, uh, the one right below in the right hand side. So that's just if you're computationally oriented. Um, I'm not gonna do uh, something beyond the first order. So I'll keep uh, with j equal to one over here. And well, um, yeah, okay. I'm gonna focus on order one, right? For which I have expression again. I know not only that these coefficients are constant, but I define them uh, coming from the initial condition. So I'm gonna plug in their values, uh, basically using this equation over here with the Kronecker deltas. Of course, that is gonna make uh, some things vanish and only the term um, in uh, equal i is gonna survive, which is why I have the i term over here. So it makes sense, right? I mean, again, the equations or the difficulties for the terms at the order one are defined by the terms at order zero and by initial condition, since the zero of order terms are constant, and we started with the initial state i, only the i uh, coefficient is non-zero, and I get reduced to this. So now in this perturbative approach, I'm now actually using perturbation theory. I can simply integrate. So again, I perform my integration in time. Then, well, I have this expression, nothing new. I simply pass the ih bar on this side. And there is one justification on why this uh, C1k at time t equal to zero is zero. And it is because we have already taken care of the initial conditions via the zero of order coefficient. And this deserves attention, um, maybe after you get experience with this, I guess um, you already, it is disregarded because it's already known, but probably it's the first time that you handle a problem like this and it's worth to mention. So this is the perturbation solution for the coefficients at the time t equal to zero. They're evaluated at t equal to zero, right? Now, we have already taken care of the initial conditions via the zeroth order term by may, basically making it equal to the initial condition of the full state at time t equal to zero, which was the Kronecker deltas, right? So this is zero order term at time equal to zero, equal to uh, evaluation at time equal to zero of the full solution, which has a series representation equal to Kronecker deltas. The Kronecker deltas don't matter too much. What matters is that I have already taken care of the initial conditions by making the zero order terms uh, equal to the initial conditions. And so basically, if I evaluate this series representation for the full uh, solution at time t equal to zero, so I have the zero order term plus the first order term, and I know that these two, oh, sorry, these two are equal. So this should be zero. And now this is evaluated at time equal to zero. But anyways, I know, I mean, this is <clears throat> basically an expansion in terms of the parameter epsilon. And this is equal to the zero function. So the only way a series can be equal to the zero function is if the associated coefficients are zero. And that means that these coefficients basically order j equal one and higher are zero because I have already taken care of the initial conditions uh, at the zero order term. So you will see that this is um, common uh, when you uh, work with perturbation theory for different problems, but it's worth to be mentioned because if not, I would have the difference and I wouldn't know beforehand why uh, the C1k at time equal to zero vanishes. So this happens for all coefficients. 
And after I know that, basically taking this difference, um, the subtractor term is zero. And I simply have that the C1k at time t is equal to this integral. So I don't need to write it because I know that the other term is zero. And well, uh, sometimes people like to multiply by this exponential because if you go back to the solution on uh, Schrodinger equation, you will have this, right? I mean, basically this would be the full time dependent term. Um, so this one is time dependent, but this one too. And so sometimes people like to know uh, what is the, the full thing uh, when you multiply these two. And so that's why when we go back to this part, um, oh, yeah, uh, I basically do this multiplication. So, okay, I can do that. I can introduce this term if I multiply on the other side in the integral. Uh, notice that this is why I have uh, this part. And if I do some algebra, I have this representation. And there's a reason people care about this uh, beyond having the full time dependence term. It is because they interpret uh, this integral in a very nice fashion. Uh, the interpretation has uh, some limitations, but um, it's also useful when you go to higher order uh, terms like j equal to two, et cetera, which is that basically um, this is thought, well, you can verify the algebra going from here to here and from here to here. But this is interpreted in the following fashion. Basically, the system is in a state uh, I with energy EI, uh, say from time zero to T prime. That's why you have this exponential. Then suddenly at the time T prime, the transition occurs and you go from the state I to the state K via the perturbation, right, which is H prime. And because the system has transitioned to the state uh, K for the remainder of the time in the interval zero T, basically from T prime to T, the system is in the state K and it has energy EK. Now, you don't know when the T prime time where you have the transition is gonna happen. And that's why you integrate over all possible t prime times of transition. So this is a neat interpretation. Um, it's basically adding some mystique to the mathematics in a way. Um, I think, yeah, it is pretty useful. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, the numbers dictate and the math is what stands, right? I mean, so these two are equivalent and you can interpret the integral, um, but what we care about is the solution at the end of the day. So I want to clarify something because my approach is partly based on McIntyre, but there are, I guess, two main differences. The main difference is that I'm not, um, well, I am actually using the epsilon parameter up to the very end as I can do because I think uh, that way it's more illustrative or, of where perturbation theory is acting. And to clarify also the order of some other terms in this approach. And that has been shown until now where I made the difference between the equations of order j based on the terms of order j minus one. But also later on, it will be useful in a couple of comments. So that's why I'm keeping it. The second, um, a thing that I want to mention if you were to consult that notation is um, that, well, McIntyre doesn't go uh, beyond order j equal one either. Uh, Griffiths does, so just FYI, if you are curious. But because McIntyre doesn't go beyond order one and uh, for the zeroth order terms, most of them are zero except for the one related to the initial state. Um, he ends up disregarding the notation of the index uh, later in his approach, as he says, well, I'm just working off order one. Um, the order zero terms are mostly zero. Well, I'll just keep the uh, CK and remove this. Um, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I, I prefer to keep things proper. Uh, perhaps it is because I am, um, 
mathematician at heart. And I just want to be proper in the treatment because later on um, it will be uh, easy to distinguish on things. So never mind. This is just a um, footnote in case you consult McIntyre's book as a side reference for your study and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So keep that in mind. And there is also something um, important to, to define, which I mean, what is popping up here, especially, uh, well, in this term, for example, also below, but I oh, know, uh, actually uh, in this one, um, is that uh, you have some associated frequency, which is gonna be called the Bohr frequency. I mean, if you think somehow in terms of the all of quantum mechanics and Planck's laws, et cetera, this is kind of giving you a frequency of transition, right? What it's telling you is, okay, I have an energy difference. And if I transition from the state I to the state K by Planck's laws, I will have a jump of, uh, of a state with associated electromagnetic radiation of frequency WKI, which is the energy difference divided by H1. So what we will see actually uh, in the next uh, lecture is that this transition occurs, but it's not that discrete. So of course, this is basically the most probable transition, but approximately there is a probability of transitioning to frequencies which are close to this value around it, but not exactly equal. But it's still very useful and it's called the word frequency. And of course it comes from the basically Planck laws and frequency of transition between these two levels divided by H bar problem. In this notation, basically, if I go over this equation and I express this, I will have this just the same with this uh, omega ki. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to make epsilon equal to one at this point. There might be some revisiting of uh, the dependence of the problem without um, uh, making epsilon equal to one later on in the next lecture. Uh, for the moment, I'm going to assume that it's been taken equal to one which at the end of the day is also done in perturbation theory, unless um, in this treatment you, uh, where do I want to go here? Well, you keep that uh, in mind that the size of the perturbation, if you keep the epsilon, the size of the perturbation can be controlled either by knowing beforehand that H prime is small, or if it's not basically by making epsilon go to zero, and then you'll get some control. So that has to be taken, uh, in mind or in account, but okay, um, just to not lose focus, the whole reason I did this approach is because the problem that I'm trying to solve is to find the probability of transition of a system from the initial state to another state, which is going to be called the final state, right? Now, I know that the probability of being in a given state, let's say F, is related to its coefficients. So actually what I will need to investigate are basically the square of those coefficients and I will, as I will show in a second. But just important, the reason I'm calculating these coefficients is because I want to know the probability of transition from the state I, which is the initial one to a final state, okay? So of course, I'm gonna assume that the F is not equal uh, to I in this framework because I want to know what's the probability of going to a different state. And well, uh, in that case, if I remember or up to first order, uh, the coefficient uh, on the state F is equal to the zeroth order term plus the order one term. I had made epsilon equal to one at this point. I know uh, that because F is not equal to I, this term is zero uh, given the initial conditions thingy that I talked about. And so CF to order one is basically just made of the first order correction. And uh, so if I want to investigate uh, the probability of transition, I had to basically investigate the square of the coefficient relating the projection of F into the state at the time T. So the probability of being uh, in the state F after having been initially in the state I, and this is why it's called a probability of transition from I to F, and therefore this notation at the time t is the square of the inner product of f with uh, psi at time t. So the square of the coefficients obtained from the projection. 
and I can perform this, right? Because I know the series solution for Psi. Uh, let's do that. I mean, I will expand inside and then um, take norm squared. And then if I do that, basically I use linearity. I have the inner product of F with N. This is a Kronecker delta due to the orthonormality of the complete old faces. Then this is gonna project only to CF as I expected. And I have this exponential, but I'm taking norm squared. So I can disregard this because this is basically a complex vector of norm one. So it doesn't matter. So I have a norm of CF squared of time T. And again, in to, up to first order after this rationale, I have that this is approximately the order one term, which is the correction, right, at time t. So this is approximate because we are up to first order expansion in this case. And so if I simply use this um, formula that I have for the coefficients where f is not equal to i, um, then I simply basically take, take norm squared. Of course, the i is not going to appear. I have 1 over h bar. And then I have this integral with, of course, k equal to f squared. Right, so I have the norm squared of this integral, of this complex integral actually, um, where f is not equal to i. And of course you have this nice interpretation that I already mentioned a little bit ago. So again, this result is approximate up to first order, um, especially visible when I do this. And so up to first order, yeah, time dependent perturbation theory, I have calculated the probability of transitioning from the initial state i to another state f, which is possibly the final state, right? Of course, I have a span of possibilities as f is, could be uh, any other um, state not uh, equal to the initial one in this treatment or in this way of thinking. And uh, well, this is due, of course, to the perturbing Hamiltonian, which is time dependent, which is h prime, and which basically, because it's time dependent, it moves the states uh, or an eigenstate from being basically stationary to transitioning to another final state. So yeah, so far so good. I think we can stop up to here for today, uh, for this lecture. Um, I will continue next week uh, with the remainders of time-dependent perturbation theory, meaning uh, Fermi golden rule and the interaction of uh, electromagnetic fields with hydrogen atoms. So yeah, I mean, so far so good. I think this is a very nice topic. I really like it. Um, the math is very clean. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I would recommend you to um, focus on the distinction between the math method, the physics, and when we start using perturbation theory in this topic, because the distinction is very clear at uh, this point, like where we're just basically proposing an a series solution, which is exact up to this point. When do we start using perturbation theory? And when do we start feeding the physics to the problem to completely define it, right? To pose it, uh, uh, to pose um, this is a mathematical model where we have the information of the initial conditions, what is the initial time at which uh, the perturbation starts, etc. And then we arrive to this uh, new formula. But for the moment, this is enough. Um, best of luck uh, for um, basically the rest of the week. And don't forget that you have an exam uh, next Friday. So see you soon.